Good morning, everyone. So here we are, Romans chapter 15. And uh, those of you that have bothered to read the book, I'll find there's only one more chapter afterwards. So you might be, ooh, we've come to the end, or you might be hip 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 hooraying. But uh, we're coming to this final section and the verses that I'm going to focus on this morning are verses 14 to 33. I'm not going to read them all out for sake of time. Um, but, but to give you something just to base it on, I'm, my subject, the title that I'm giving my talk out of this chapter this morning is called The Essential Church. The Essential Church. What should church really look like if it's populated with people that have believed that what they've been taught in the previous chapters and verses that Paul's doctrine has brought to us. He's, he's come to the end really of that doctrinal piece and, and he introduces us in this section to his personal priorities, the values that are seemingly really important to him. He's made a shift of emphasis as well. The first part of Paul's writings is very personal and very individual focused. That's why Romans is such an uncomfortable book to face. Because the truths that he expresses are to us as individuals. There's no kind of get out. Your faith can't save me from my sins. My faith can't achieve for you justification by faith. My living sacrifice, can't, your living sacrifice can't transform my mind. Think about that. If I was a better person dependent on what you did. No, he says it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work, and we all know that if we're brought up in a Christian home, it doesn't guarantee us our salvation. There's an individual response that is required, and that's, as Paul says in many cases, it becomes challenging. The Holy Spirit eyeballs us and, and leaves us a little bit isolated. But, but, but in the isolation, as Arthur has just testified there, there are streams of love, streams of acceptance, streams of goodness. And though it's individually focused, it is, it is filled. If you'll hear the voice and the tender spirit of God, it is so wonderful. But an individual response is required. But Paul now turns his attention to the church, the corporate individuals, and, and starts to talk to us about values that give us the very core of church life. And, and I love the tone that he sets because what should, I, 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 want to get, I want to try and get through teaching the exegesis of the scriptures to rather talk about what should church look like? What should we expect here at Eagle's Nest? And he sets the tone in, in verse 13 of this chapter. I'm reading J.B. Phillips' version. And, and he says this, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in your faith, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, your whole life and outlook may be radiant with hope. Wow. He, he says, guys, I want church to be good. I want church, the experience of church, to be vibrant. He says, he, says, he says to them, he says, this actually is normal church life. Now, anybody like, well, any of us that go around to churches and, and we examine our own church, it ain't like that, is it? But the dependency is not on the preacher, not on the leader. The dependency of the vibrancy of the church is you. It's me that contribute to this, that we... We quite rightly emphasize our devotion to Christ and we're strong in our emphasis of worship. But Christ wants also us to live with a sense of destiny. That tomorrow 
is not to be feared. That tomorrow should be faced with hope and those words of Paul, be radiant, be, be, be overflowing with hope. And this flies in the face of the wind of what is happening in the world today. It flies in the face of the wind of what the media is telling us. And the, our, our neighbours and, and, and the prevailing mindset, remember where we were in Romans 12 about that impressed mind that we should not be conformed to. But the Holy Spirit is there to bring us into a sense of glorious anticipation and confidence. And that's the tone that he sets and he, he, he introduces us to what I'm going to express here, four values that are essential for us in our church life. Value number one, verse 14 to 16, is that we fulfill our potential. We fulfill our potential. Paul's confidence spills over. He says this, verse 14, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you, yourselves, are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. He says, church, if you embrace the work of salvation, if you take on board the willingness of the person of the Holy Spirit to come into your life and live in this life in the Spirit, rather than live in the flesh, that living to yourself... I am confident that you've got what it takes through Christ to bless, build and encourage one another. That's what he's saying to us. He's saying, he's saying, you're full of goodness, you're complete in knowledge and competent to instruct. The, 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 the old word instruct there, uh, in the older versions, it says admonish, which means kind of, our language thinks, gives each other a bit of a rollicking. Well, it doesn't really mean that, but it means to train. We disciple one another. Discipleship starts, the model starts with the leader and the elders, but it continues right throughout the church. You want to look at the person next to you and say, I need you. You look at them and even if you don't meet, you say, I value you. You're good for me. I need every one of you. I, it, it doesn't make logical sense, but I know that I'm a better person when I know that I'm loved and cared for by you and you are better by my love and commitment to you. We train one another. In fact, here's the truth. This is a new def definition of church. Church is a discipleship factory. It's the place where together we make Christians. Now, the cross does it work for salvation, but the church is the place where we make Christians. And we're a discipleship factory. And so there's a potential in every one of us to be fulfilled. The second thing that we see is the centrality of Christ in the church and in our lives. Verse 17, he says this. Therefore, I glory, older versions say, I boast in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Paul, we're warned about excesses. But with due consideration, I want to say that Paul was obsessed by Jesus. And so I have to ask myself the question, not am I obsessed by Jesus, but should I be? And, and we may not like the word obsession, obsession, a preoccupation, but preoccupation. The simple fact is, uh, everything that I see in Scripture and everything anecdotally I can tell you about my life is that the more Jesus is at the very epicenter of my life, the more blessed life becomes. We make him. What is, and, and that's kind of a bit of, you know, we've got scriptures. Uh, Paul, Paul writes to the Colossians, that, that glorious piece in Colossians 1. Here's Philip's again. And now he, Christ, is the head of all the church, all Christian people, life from nothing, began through him 
and life from the dead began through him. And he is therefore justly called Lord of all. He's, he's the epicenter of everything. We, we've, we studied Romans and we got to that lovely song, the doxology in Romans 11. For from him and through him and to him are all things. He says, he says church, will you allow this truth to filter into your being and spirit? Jesus is at the center of everything. And live your lives in that. He's the center of our solar system. Our lives should be round in orbit around him. Not Jesus in orbit around our lives. I, I, I've, got, I've got time to fit Jesus in on Sunday morning. I've got f- time to fit Jesus in for, for a play a few albums. I've got time to fit Jesus in for a hub. I've got time to fit. No, 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 no. He's center of everything. And how, how does this, what does it look like? You know, because that's a theological truth and I'm not embarrassed by it. But, but, it, but, but I'm an ordinary bloke. Married, got kids, you know, retired but busy. And what does it all look like? And, and, and the only, the, 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 the nearest thing I can compare it to is marriage. The, 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 what does, because we all would not be embarrassed to say, in response to a question, do you love Jesus? And the answer is, yes, we love Jesus. Well, well, I've been married for 50 years this year, so I can, I can reflect a little bit of what love looks like. Now, I tell her. She probably thinks I don't tell her enough, but I, I do tell her. Um, I don't write poetry. You know, she's, she's saying a big amen if you can't hear it at the front. I, I'm not a romantic. Uh, that's what it, and that doesn't mean you can't be, guys. I'm just being honest about my car example. But, but the simple fact is, I express my love by what I do, my behavior. So, if you look at my month, I spend hours in supermarkets. I spend, I spend even more hours in garden centres. I've watched repeats of location, location, location to ad nauseum. And, and, and what, what is it all about? It's all about one simple thing. I'm happier being with her than without her. No, 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 don't get that. That's, that's romantic almost. <laughs> Brownie points from the girls. Not getting many thumbs up from the chaps, but. <laughs> you see, you see, and if you talk to Pauline, she'd have her list of what she does that are not her favourites. Because what I've expressed, what I do, is nothing to do with my temperament, my personality. I'm not up for supermarkets or garden centres once a, once a month, once a year is enough. But, but, so it's not my temperament, it's my demonstration of my value of being with this person that I love. So, why do I apply that spiritually? My little, my, my life, my, my simple life is practice this, that I take Jesus with me everywhere I go. Some guy kind of observed a, a kind of critical element when I went to Wembley the other week to watch Forest, and it was on a Sunday and, and gave me a bit of a, a frown. And I said, it's all right, I took Jesus with me. <laughs> I did. When I'm watching a film, I make sure that Jesus is with me. When I'm reading a book, I make sure Jesus is with me. When I'm on social media, I say, Lord Jesus, will you be with me? When I'm browsing the internet, I want to make sure that Jesus is with me. And the simple fact is, is that my companionship with Jesus is whether Jesus is interested in the film, the film, the, the, the book, the football match or not, he's interested in me in not only what I'm watching, not only what I'm doing, but the way that I'm doing it. He's central. 
You see, I wouldn't cheat on my wife publicly. And I wouldn't cheat on her privately, but we've got to trust one another in that. So in my public behavior with Jesus, we'll look after my secret attitudes to Jesus by keeping him central. We bring glory about Christ in the way that we live. Number three, verse 20. He says these words. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was what known was not known. Principal value of the essence of church is that we seek the lost. We, we, we celebrate being family. We love one another. But we accept the discomfort and the dislodging of our poise for the price of reaching the lost. Paul here, the great theologian, the great teacher, Paul the great spiritual father who had a cluster of disciples and sons and daughters in the faith. He was busy with all that, but he never lost his sense of mission. Never lost his sense of mission because he caught something from Jesus. If we study the parables and we, we looked at the parable of the, of the, of the lost sheep, and we, we just take it on board. And of course, we all know the story that 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 was one missing of the 100. There was one missing. And, and Jesus left the 99 to go and find the one lost sheep. If you were a Jew in that day, and particularly if you were a shepherd, they would have laughed at Jesus beyond derision. One miserable sheep. Their profit margins were in the hole. Nobody would give up and make the 99 vulnerable for the sake of one skinny, miserable sheep that's likely to be sacrificed on the daily altar anyway. Jesus spoke something that was countercultural. He was saying God's love for people is so vibrant that every lost soul matters. That's what he's saying to us. And, and, and we've got to look at our neighborhoods and we've got to look at our friends and our families and, and lament that they don't know Jesus and be sad about the culture that they're in and sometimes get angry about the decisions they make and, and, and acknowledge there's a separation, there's a gap, they are different. But in all that, we should never, <coughs> excuse me, stop loving them and we should never stop seeking opportunities to win them. For Christ we celebrate today that there are more Christians on the planet than ever before in the whole of existence and we celebrate that but we should also be driven by the fact there are more lost lives on the planet today than there's ever been before the population numbers work both ways we glory that there's nearly 2 billion Christians but there's 7 billion who don't, and nine, uh, 5 billion who don't know him See, evangelism church is not an option and I'm not an evangelist. So how do we play our part? What does it look like for me? Number one, I've got to pray. I've got to pray because praying for my neighbours, praying for my unsaved family, praying for my friends, praying for those who are backslidden, praying for them keeps them at least in my mind. I bring them to God, but it keeps them in my mind. I, I have a sense of urgency that... Lost people matter to God. The second thing that we can do is love. Sin makes us angry and sin in other people makes us sad. But in our sadness, in our anger, we should never reject. We should show acts of kindness. We've shown a, a few acts of kindness to our neighbor opposite. Uh, and, and she lost her husband last year. And we've not, we've not, been, we've not been hugely vocal about our lives but, but we went to her 80th party last weekend and family and friends and the whole street were there and everybody who met us, he says, oh, you're the vicar, aren't you? The whole street knew that I was a minister. The whole street knew that we were Christians. Why? Because we'd shown a little bit of kindness and the neighbours had done the evangelising and telling. I'm, I'm in dialogue with one of the neighbours up the, up the road who said, I'm a, Christ, I'm a, I'm a backslider, John. You need to take me in hand. And come the right moment, I'll, I'll bring, please God, Julie, to church. We, 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 
We love. We speak. We share our knowledge of Christ's goodness. That's what I've talked about. We believe in the power of preaching. That's why we're having a Mark Ritchie. That's why we consistently give people the opportunity of giving their lives to God. We keep going. We keep going. It seems so difficult. But a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated a 25th anniversary of this church. 26 years ago, this church was a dream. 26 years ago, this, this church was just a prayer in my heart. 26 years ago, I, I had that moment where I, I pulled out a tatty old mat and said, God, where, where do you want us to go? And God said, Red Hill. 26 years ago, I met a young man I'd never met before. And his name was John Fahey and he shared me his heart. And 26 years ago, we went for a drive one afternoon and found this place. And with half an hour, I'd signed a contract for the use of the building. 26 years ago, it was a dream, but now... The reality is that we've touched hundreds, if not thousands, of lives in the community. And the gospel is being preached. It's not impossible, church, that we can share the gospel of grace. Finally, we partner with others. Verse 30 and up to 33. I urge you, brothers by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle, in my ministry. Paul illustrates to the Roman church in verse 26 the example of Macedonia church and the Achaia church. They were hundreds of miles apart. They were nowhere near Rome and they weren't near each other. But they contributed to the needs of others. They, they worked in partnership and Paul having used that illustration in verse 26 verse 30 says church eagle's nest I urge you to share in the needs and the ministry of other churches he says he says please help me please stand with me the truth is it's a question that is asked graciously like all the questions that God asks us graciously but there's an urgency behind it <coughs> that should not be disobeyed. The truth is this, that in Paul's family of churches, their business was the Romans' business. And the Roman church's business was their business. Of course we've got our own identity. Of course we've got our own community. Of course we've got our own culture. Of course we've got our own harvest of souls to reap. It's all true. But in the truth of God wanting to bless us to the fullest degree, he says, be in partnership with others. It's a spiritual principle that goes from the body ministry of how we all need one another to be a church. So churches under the same spiritual fathers need to be in the same relationship together. The slogan of our little NG family is that we're stronger together. And it's not just some little slight spiritual thing. We're stronger together when we pray together. We're stronger together. So, so here's, here's what it looks like to be part of NG. And somebody said, what's NG? Well, NG is the network of churches that we, we've developed and cared for. Your involvement in NG can look like this. You can pray for John as he leads it, that God will give him inspiration, that God will give him wisdom, that God will give him the grace to look after this network of churches and still be the outstanding leader that he is here. If any of you wonder where I am two-thirds of the year when I'm not worshipping with you, I'm out preaching in these churches. It would be lovely to know, not when from a selfish position, that one or two of you might say, I'm praying for you, John. Not only pray God helps him when he preaches here, but God help John when he preaches in the other churches. It's, it's, it's part of the partnership. We join together in the family meetings. And so the first temptation that comes when we meet at Emmanuel uh, 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 and, and we have twice a year a gathering of the NG churches. Oh, great, it's a morning off. No. If you really truly believe in the partnership of the gospel, it's an opportunity to worship the same God. 
but listen and meet with other family members that you haven't seen for ages or even before and develop your friendships. We join the family meetings. Finally, we, we're willing to receive their gifts and talent when they come to serve us. Occasionally we do that. We'd be willing to give our gifts and talents to order to strengthen them. Paul did this with all his teams. And he got his family as Timothy and his Titus and, uh, and, and all the fantastic women. And you're going to hear more about that next week from Ben. He, he sent them to work together in teams. Time's done. The individual response to the glory of the gospel impacts our church. And Paul defines the church in Corinthians. He, he calls it a fragrance. It has a perfume. It has an aroma. It's interesting. I watched a little bit on one of these daft programs that Pauline makes me watch about, about perfume making. And you, I find out how you make perfume. You have a higher tone. You have a middle tone and you have a bass tone. And individually, they stink to high heaven. Horrible. And some of them are very bland. But they come together and they're held by what is called a carrier oil. I was go I'd gone, wow, come on, Holy Spirit. That we're all different. We're different individuals. And some of you have got high notes and some of you have got bass notes. And some of you have got lovely kind of personalities that blends with everybody and some of us are, are invisible in our temperament and personality but, but the Holy Spirit pulls us together and we become the vibrant fragrant of Christ to one another and to the world we belong to a fantastic body of people called the church and Paul's essence is that we celebrate one another and build us on that we make Christ central that we seek the lost and we partner together in other regions to win the world and the kingdom for Jesus Christ. With vibrant, passionate faith, they move forward. It's hot and sticky, but metaphorically, church, get off your backsides, celebrate Jesus, and let's live for his glory. Amen. i
God, I love to. God, I love to. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I love to. You're where my help is from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. just as we, they continue to play. Um, if you have a young person who's in RISE, that age group, can you wave at me to see who's here today? Okay. Um, we're just going to pray for you. Um, it's almost the school holidays, and I think particularly for that age group, we're singing about God, God giving us wisdom, about God giving us a vision to see things the way He sees them. Um, and I just want to pray for you. So if, people, if you can gather around those people, if you just wave again, if you're standing near someone that has a rise person, a rise young person, then uh, let's gather around. And if you just pray however you want to pray, I'm just going to speak that verse, verse 13 that John mentioned earlier. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you for the young people that you've given us. Thank you for the families that are here. And Father, I pray for these parents and carers that you'd give them all the wisdom and all the love, all the hope, all the joy that they need at this time. Father God, we know that it's not always easy to see things the way you see them or the way the young person sees them, Father God. But we pray for all the gifts that, and all the attitude and all the compassion and all the patience that these people need. Would you bless them this morning, Lord God? Thank you, Jesus.